Hello, everyone. Welcome to Emerging Brands Franchises on the Rise. I'm your host, Cash Miller. I'm also the CEO of Titan Media Works. We do podcast production. Today, we've got a, a unique education opportunity because, you know, early childhood education in this country is, it's, to put it bluntly, it suffers from a lack of options. You know, there's not a lot for kids that are younger to really connect. And this one, this opportunity is all about, you know, connecting with nature, which is really something that young kids, they don't do enough of. We need more of this. I've got with me Jen Legere. She is with A Place to Grow. Jen, it's great to have you on. Tell us a bit about yourself, the franchise, why you got into this since you're the founder. Uh-huh. Yeah. So uh, my name is Jen and I'm in Brentwood, New Hampshire is where we're currently located. And I was a mom with two young children. My kids were one in three when I left corporate America. I was a project manager for a pharmaceutical company. It was awesome and amazing. But my boss told me I was a woman of birthing years and I wasn't going to get a promotion. Like literally, Ooh. like that's what happened. <laughs> so like that searing moment, right? it stuck in my brain and I was like, you can't not unhear that. So I wasn't happy with our childcare situation. Yes, we're making money. We're young professionals. Life is mm. good. But my kids weren't happy. My daughter had anxiety. She's biting her fingernails. Like she just really was struggling in school. Mm. And I'm like, we're dropping the kids at 630 and picking them up at five o'clock at night. We're like hurrying to make dinner. Yeah. I'm like, what are we doing? Like I have a boss who's like, you're not going anywhere. We're not, we love you in what you're doing, but we're not going to grow you. I'm a mom. I've got, you know, these wonderful kids. My background yeah. was actually teaching natural science and math in secondary ed. And I was like, you know what? I'm done. <laughs> like, so it's time for a new opportunity that makes more sense for me, my family, the kids. And I think that's really how people come into this field. Like you have a background in education and something happened in your life, whether it's your family life or you've had a child or something like that, that's just triggered that you're like, I'm done. It's time for a change. What's that change for me? And how do I, how do I find the right fit for me? Um, so I feel I love listening to people's stories and what that trigger was for them. Yeah. yeah, I think in this country, you know, educators um, are definitely an underappreciated group. You know, they go through a lot. Children are not easy, as any parent can tell you. And you're asking them to deal with not just yours, you know, for eight hours or whatever, uh, but maybe, you know, 10 or 20 others, you know, and that's, <laughs> you know, that's a lot for one person to be able to take on. Yeah. You know, it's but, funny. But, it's always easier to raise other people's children than it is your own. So, like. Yeah. You know, raising mine to you like that, right? As any parent, you're like, wow, that's mm-hmm. the hard stuff. But helping raise other people's kids, I'm trained to do it. And it's fairly easy for me. And I love it. I mean, it's yeah. totally what I'm passionate about. Yeah. And I think, let's like say, you have to be with this kind of a business. You you need to be passionate about children and about, you know, helping them grow as people, you know, because let's like say and yep. learn things. And so you've got an interesting um opportunity, you know, on how you go about the education, because there's, you know, some of the most successful franchise education businesses, they got some angle, honestly, that, that, that is good for, you know, whoever the uh, customer is or client in this case, Mm -hmm. really small children, right? So something that's beneficial. And so the describe to us the business model and what's making it unique, because like I say, there's people, you know, you've got early childhood, you know, that are essentially daycares and stuff, but you're not yeah. quite that, you know, you're, you're, yeah. you have a point of education for them. We do. I actually refer to our, our child care center as a school. So like we're going to school today, you know, when parents are like, Oh, we're just going to daycare. I'm like, mm, mm, like, no, like it's not just daycare. <laughs> like we're a school, we're learning, we're active, whether it's social, emotional learning skills or they're, you know, connecting to nature or they're, you know, using some of their other early learning standards, they're learning. Little children are giant sponges. These tiny humans in their brains just have such <laughs> capacity to learn. So it's such a misnomer to say they're just going to daycare or they're just being yeah. babysat. We are teaching them. So what we're doing is we're really actively taking our state's early learning standards and connecting them to nature. That's what's unique about our school is our hook is we have this connections to nature piece and we're thoughtfully putting it throughout the entirety of our curriculum so that children can see life cycles around them. They're experiencing the weather patterns, season patterns, 
life cycle changes. We hatch chickens inside of our school every year. I mean, 20, Mm. you can get a two year old to watch eggs for 28 (laughs) days. Like I literally had a two year old sit like this. Hi, little chicky. Hi, baby chicky. Can I talk to you, baby chicky? 28 days. <laughs> oh my like, God. He couldn't sit still for two seconds, like for anything else. So it's these little opportunities, like growing vegetable seeds. Like they mm. have to be patient, kind. They're learning how to take care of something, raise yeah. it, that it's time and patience and thoughtfulness. So as little as these things are, they're learning really important life skills mm. that there's nurturing and caring and kindness and everything that we need to do and that life happens slowly and it takes time it's not magic you can't yeah. just you know go make that tomato plant grow you, you gotta take care of it so That's it's an sure. incredible life skill like they it's not that instant gratification that so many children are familiar with nowadays it's really slowing down our world and building intentionality for that connection to nature mm-hmm. So describe to me, if you can, like, what is, if I was two years old, what would my day look like? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, a parent drops, mm. drops the child off. You know, what's, what's a typical day, you know, for those young children? You know, what do they get to see and experience? Because you said, okay, yeah, we can stir at chicken eggs all day, but let's go through a little <laughs> bit, you know, like how long are they there for and what are they doing when they're there besides, you know, that? Yeah, of course. So the days are pretty diverse. It depends on what we're doing every day in our curriculum. There is an early learning standard that we're teaching towards. So we have a monthly theme. um, And then inside of that theme, we've broken it down into like a content area and a topic that we're talking about. Um, So, you know, their day, you know, in a nutshell might be like coming in, eating snacks, socializing with their friends. They'll have circle time, morning meeting, call it what you will in different parts of the country. They call it different things. We'll read a book that's related to our curriculum. Today, we read a book about forest succession, which was awesome. Um, My two-year-old that read that loved it and wanted to carry it home with her. So, you know, we read a book, talk about it, and then we go outside afterwards. And then we're talking about that curriculum. What did we just learn about? How can we apply it? In, in our play outside, we're really connecting that learning piece with our, you know, our outdoor education. At our school, we spend most of our days outside. Um, so we're really always building in that connection to nature. And, you know, what do we learn about and how can we do it? So project, there's outdoor play, lunchtime, nap time, of course. And our children are very tired because they're outside all day. Yeah. Um, which is awesome. And more snacks, 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 more snacks. <laughs> hey, they're active. They, they got to keep, they you know, they gotta they keep their energy up. So lots of active learning is really what we're all about. We want our children to be moving, grooving outside, you know, and we bring um, very thoughtful intention to our curriculum for them. What do you think it brings to them, you know, being so interactive with nature versus a typical childcare setting? You know, like how much of a difference do you think, just personal opinion, you know, but um, in, as far as being impactful on their life, you know, like I say, you could yeah. just go to childcare and you could basically go outside, you know, when they let you play on the jungle gym or whatever, they've got, you know, plastic toys out back, you're taking them out and they're experiencing, yeah. you know, life really. So how much of a difference yeah. do you think it makes for them? It's huge. I mean, if you go to, you know, a place that's staged and like, you're going to like this because it's, you know, this color and it's this shape. And I think, you know, if they've done all this market research, this is going to appeal to a two-year-old. But the reality is a two-year-old really likes to pick up worms underneath that, you know, (laughs) rock that they found. And they're perfectly happy playing with a worm and sticking it in their pocket. We actually have to check our pockets for worms because our children smuggle them in. Um, Mm. That's what they want. They want to go get dirty. They want to be muddy. They want to engage with their full body. These little bodies are so busy. They get bored in a traditional classroom. And honestly, I would too. I cannot yeah. sit for 30 minutes. You'll see me moving. I'm like, I'm totally an active learner. So they get bored. Like I, they just don't want blocks and books and like 10 colored pencils and like five books over mm-hmm. here and a doll. They want to play and engage and get messy and dirty and, you know, really like get into things. Yeah. I think, I think that's really important because as a, as a society, 
you know, children have lost that ability. We had that, you know, because of technology and everything, you know, it's constantly on iPads and watching, you know, TV, some yeah. streaming service or whatever. And I didn't grow up that way. You know, I, you know, even at the youngest ages, we were out at the park, we were playing, we were scuffing our mm -hmm. knees, we were, you know, sliding down slides that now today would be banned, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah. you know. I say we would you know go around the the merry-go-round and how fast mm -hmm. could we get it spinning before we jumped off you know yeah <laughs> yeah but climbing. risky play is so important yeah so and that's one of the things I love about nature-based education is that it naturally encompasses risky play so we have children with challenging behaviors some of these challenging behaviors have emerged because they don't have enough opportunities for movement. So yeah. they're climbing trees, they're jumping off of rocks, they can pick up the log, they can move the log. Mm -hmm. If you can pick it up and you can move it and you can climb it, you can do it in one of our centers. Please help yourselves. There's nothing worse to me than we had a teacher who's like, please don't pick up that little, like she was brand new. She's like, don't pick up that that rock, you're gonna hurt your toes. I was like, pick up that rock all day long. And if you need a Band-Aid for your toe later, I'll Band-Aid you. Yeah. But these kids learn naturally this way. Like that was too much for me. I'm not going to pick up that rock again, but wait, there was something really cool under that. So it was worth the toe that I just injured because I dropped the rock on my foot, but their decisions they get to make in a really calculated way that makes sense for them. So that self-regulation is so important. So our OTs, yeah. PTs, therapists, behavioral consultants, they think a place to grow is a dream come true because they're like, you're giving these kids everything their bodies need. Yes, we are. Yeah. And so it's in its own way, it's a little bit of a throwback. It's the way we used to learn, you know, it's still a yeah. controlled environment. You know, you're still able to be okay. step in if they're about to do something really, you know, that they shouldn't, but mm -hmm. you know, at least say they have that chance to really learn and grow. Okay. So let's, Let's talk about it, you know, from a business opportunity now. So, yeah. you know, let's start with, um, honestly, like the facilities themselves, the staff, like how, how big is a typical facility square footage wise? Um, and how big is the staff, you know, that you need? And then how, and I've seen this with a few um, educational base, like there's a uh, kind of a number of students you can handle if it's at its peak, you know? So what does that look like? Yeah, you know, for that way we have a, a good feel for the location. Yeah. yeah, so I think this is a really interesting business model that we're creating because we've designed it so that it's fully scalable from family child care with six children, five or six children out of a home or a small business location to, you know, 50 to 100 children. Mm. I really like this medium sized school with 50 because building in that sense of community and a family oriented environment is really important to me. It's, it feels more like family care when you have 50 children at a hundred, you become a number and a name and you don't get to know everyone. Right. I really like that sense of community. And that really sets us apart from most childcare centers um, or franchises because they want the bigger, better, you know, there's more money with more children. Mm -hmm. I want really small, thoughtfully designed centers that are part of a community and have a heart and soul that is going to be part of them. Um, so, yeah. Okay. So let's say we have 50. How many people would it take um, from a staff standpoint yeah. to take yeah. care of that many? And also, what are some of the roles that the, you, know, you have to fill um, mm -hmm. to be able to manage that facility? Yeah. So at 50 students, we have a director. Every site has to have a director. Sometimes it's the owner. We really love it when the owner is actually the director because they're in the classroom operations on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so that's really important for us that they have that oversight. And then each classroom has to have at least one lead teacher in it. Depends on the state and the ratios involved, but usually one to two teachers in each classroom. Um, and then you know, maybe someone, you know, as an assistant director helping with scheduling or something. So right now I'm actually licensed for 52 and I have 16 staff members that we use on a regular okay, basis. So, okay. Between so, part-time and full-time. Okay. Got it. So, you know, so the staffing, okay. How challenging is it because of the field to be able to staff mm -hmm. up then? Mm -hmm. So we're doing a lot in our business model to really help with the staffing. Um, we're creating apprenticeships for um, people learning how to become directors. 
um, yeah. and give them the business experience that they need because that's kind of missing. We also yeah. have apprenticeships and internships that we do with high school students or people coming into the field to help train um, in what they need to know. So is it hard? Yes, it is more challenging. I think we're all experiencing, you know, the, the challenges of hiring right now across yeah. the entire United States in any field. Mm-hmm. Um, but because we've been really thoughtful in building out our like pipeline from high school students using internships all the way through these director level apprenticeships that we're creating now, it's helped to build a robust pipeline that keeps people wanting, including the franchising. That's, you know, the end of this pipeline keep people developed all the way from, you know, the time they've started. Actually, I'm going to tell you a story really quick. Okay, sure. I have three students right now who are my first students at A Place to Grow who are working for me as high school students now. Oh, wow. So we really go from like, like babies in building that pipeline in like that nurturing those relationships all the way through an entire career. So super meaningful to me that there's that depth of that well, pipeline that you're building. It, it speaks well of the franchise because that says the experience was so good and they actually remember it because they would have been pretty young, you know, yep. and so they actually remember it to, to go back and say, well, now I want to help with this. So that's, yeah. say, it speaks well of you and you know the, the company itself. Yeah. I've had students, you know, who remember their first like lessons, like reading and writing with me, who published his own book in high school. And Mm. he was so excited about his book that he, like, I was the first person that he gave a signed copy to. He's like, Miss Jen, I have to come see you. And we have like a picture with him holding his book. Like these things just make you so happy Mm -hmm. that they, like, they remember you from back then and you've moved forward with them in their life. So yeah, super meaningful. What are some of the, you know, to be able to um, recruit students, as it were, you know, and the parents and everything, you know, uh, to build your enrollment? What are some of the tactics you typically use? You know, if a location was just getting started, how do you try to build it up, you know, over time? Yeah, I think that connections to nature piece is really important for families. They are looking for that, call it retro vibe of what we had when we were kids. They want that for their children. And I think that that's a huge part of our ability to recruit and retain, you know, families and staff because we're the only ones in our area. We're the only nature-based childcare franchise. Period. Mm-hmm. Um, let alone like we're really the only one, you know, in our region who's like that kind of style of learning. And parents want it, and they're willing to pay for it. And they'll be on a wait list for three years sometimes <laughs> to, to get that experience, but. Um, yeah, it's super meaningful to them. You mentioned they're willing to pay for it. What is it? Um, just, is there a particular number that it costs to send a student, you know, like on a monthly basis? Yeah. Yeah. So we, you know, we do market read analysis and make sure that our tuition is affordable across all of our schools and meets the market needs for where we Mm -hmm. are. Um, but maintaining a really high student teacher ratio or low student teacher ratio with, you know, as many staff as we have in the build out of our pipeline, and we have 13 acres in our main facility, you know, that takes a lot of time and money in order to be able to, to manage all of those things. So, you know, tuition is a little bit higher for our, our type of setting, um, but we want to make sure that it remains within our market, <clears throat> within the market range. So it's a whole yeah, balance so, that we put on. So, you know, based on the market, it'll vary a little bit because you'll you'll yeah. study the conditions there and see what other companies are charging and stuff and see where you need to be. You know, so yeah. it's that, that kind of research. Um, yeah. OK, so let's get into the actual investment side of it. You know, mm-hmm. what are the what kind of franchise fees? Um, you know, you've got build outs, you know, potentially. So what kind of space are you usually looking for? Mm-hmm. Um, what does the. uh the site selection, what kind of support do you provide? Because you're going to, you know, you know the business best. You're going to have a, you know, mm-hmm. you'll know what locations might have a better chance of success and stuff. Yeah. But what does it take to, you know, once you pick one, what does it take to kind of build it out? And it's going to vary, of course. So it just ranges, oh, yeah. um, you know, mm-hmm. looking. For, but what kind of cost do we have associated with it? Yeah. So I would say that that range is as big as a barn door. So we're fully scalable. <laughs> so right, it, it's huge. We, you have no idea. So if you're a family child care center, let's start with our franchise fee because that's really the most forward, you know, mm-hmm. fee that people think about. We decided to make our franchise fee very low. 
it's very approachable at 35,000. And we actually right. go so far as to fund that at a thousand dollars a month for most families. We oh, want to wow. break it down so that you're earning revenue so that you're paying your franchise fee as you're earning revenue and it's not pulling out of your pocket. You don't have to go get a loan to do it. We, you can get an SBA loan. We are qualified to be able to do that, but, um, we really want to make it approachable. We're teachers. We don't, we don't make millions of dollars, you know, so, yeah. you, you know, we're really looking for those passionate educators who want to do something a little bit different with their lives. And how do I do that? So we want to make it affordable for them as best as we can. And that's one way to do it is with that franchise fee. So um, really breaking that down and help them to be able to make that initial training process and franchise entry as affordable as possible. So we really start with family childcare being our baseline model. Okay. And what we love about that is like you're using your home. So there's great tax benefits to having a business out of your house. You're less startup costs because it's your home. So you can usually go, you know, Facebook marketplace and shop for secondhand stuff at your thrift store, you know, a small kitchen center, a playground, a, you know, a little play set, stuff like that. It's not really big dollars to set up something out of, you know, at your home. We see the most expensive thing is the fence around your house that you need to have. And that's, yeah. you know, we see about $10,000 sometimes for a startup, but we've had one franchise who did it for free. Someone was doing a project and got all their friends fencing for free. So it was just manpower to install it. Hmm. Um, so it can be really inexpensive. And if you're, you know, going to a big school, you know, with a hundred kids, 200 kids, then you could see up a couple hundred thousand dollars to a million dollars for a build out. So it really yeah. depends on what your project scope is and where you want to be. So $10,000, you know, mm -hmm. $2 million. What kind of, um, what makes like the ideal location? Cause you mentioned being out of the house and stuff, you know, potentially, um, mm -hmm. but is, you know, depending on the number of kids, is that always going to be a feasible thing or do you encourage finding a space? Cause I can see the smaller one, you know, okay, that's fine. But a larger one, and you mentioned you got, you know, a facility with 13 acres. So I assume that's not out of somebody's house necessarily. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. So what makes a good space? Um, really location and what's important to you. So if you have, you know, a, a house and a, and a home located in a really nice residential area, that's rich and it's a good, place for people to just be able to walk to and it has a nice neighborhood vibe, you know, with like a, a local, you know, park right down the street, that can be an amazing location that we can really capitalize on. Or, you know, maybe you're in a super urban setting and where your house is doesn't really make sense. So we're looking at alternative locations. So we're looking for some outdoor, you know, space to have. It doesn't have to be huge. It doesn't have to be 13 acres. And we can do this in little tiny plots of land in urban settings. So as long as you have an outdoor space where you can go and you can actively okay. be involved in getting outside and, you know, your space inside is warm, cozy and inviting, we can make all sorts of things work. Okay. Um, from a training standpoint, what does it take to get the, like, what kind of training support do you, you know, provide? Mm -hmm. Because you're trying to run a business, but you also have the educators, you know, that need to be trained on how that business works mm -hmm. and stuff. So what are you typically looking for from an educator standpoint? Because I don't know if they need, <clears throat> if you're looking for like teaching certificates, things like that, you know, so how do you yeah. train them? And then who are you looking for from a staff perspective, you know, to, when you got to recruit? Yeah. So typically our owners are coming from fields of education or they have a degree in early childhood ed or maybe elementary ed. We even see, I was I came out of secondary education. What we're really doing as part of the franchise is if you come from education, our FTD, we're training you in all the business aspects mm -hmm. and what it takes to run the business. And if you have a business background, we're training you on all the early childhood education aspects. So God. as part of our training process, we're really pulling those two life skills together and making sure that you're not just a passionate educator, but you have a business that's going to be solvent and continue to run because we've paired you with those skills that you need in order to do that. So it's really the marriage of those two skill sets that we're talking about when we're training our franchisees so they have the ability to be successful. And what about on an ongoing basis? So, for example, you, know, you get the initial you know, staff trained up, but I lose somebody, you know, the, the <laughs> staffer wants to leave or whatever, and I've got to bring in somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, is it something that at that point, you're, the on-site staff, the actual franchisee staff is good enough, they can train them, or is there something additional yeah. that you end up providing? 
So usually we would hope that we've trained the staff well enough that we can, you know, they'll be able to retrain them inside of the school and they won't have to send them, you know, to me to be trained. If it's a key player, like if they lost a director and they really have to retrain a key player, they might send them back to us to spend a week with us really immersed in, you know, the concept that we have to do that training. And that's charged at a separate rate, you know, it's, it's fairly nominal, you know, to help with that training time. But we try to support that training as much as we can without incurring additional fees. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, it looks like it's a really good opportunity, you know, especially if you've already been an educator. Yeah, that's, yeah. sounds like that's like your ideal franchisee is somebody that's got that, you know, that background. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can teach the business side of it and stuff. Mm -hmm. Is there, you know, and the sales are going to vary depending on the actual size and the number of students, you know, that you try to recruit. So, you know, is there any other particular things that if you were thinking about this as a business opportunity that you think they need to know, you know, a potential franchisee would know or should know? Yeah, I think it's hard because, you know, the field of childcare is getting a really bad rap right now in the United States. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, the childcare deserts, 46% of the United States doesn't have enough childcare. So there's really an incredible amount of opportunity here. So whether yeah. it's small or large, there's a lot of opportunity. So we can build a, that this scalable model that meets all of those things. But everyone thinks like, oh, we're overpaid babysitters. I'm like, no, I'm <laughs> not a babysitter, right? I don't yeah. make $5 an hour babysitting. And then they hear this message of like, oh, our teachers don't make enough money. Like who would want to be a teacher moving forward? But if you're an owner, it takes you out of that teaching role. You become an owner and actually some of our owners are earning six figure salaries where a year ago they were barely making, you know, $50,000 a year. So it's really that next step where we can transform you from like how you felt as just a teacher in the United yeah. States, you know, undervalued to like, I'm a business woman and I know what I'm doing and I'm a passionate educator and I want to share that with everyone. And it's taken me a long time in my own personal mindset to get out of like, I'm just a teacher. It, it really took me a lot of years of training in some specific classes. I went to like the Goldman Sachs 10,000 small businesses I did to realize like, I'm a business owner. I'm a powerful business person, not just a teacher. And I have a lot of really amazing things to offer. So yeah, I think we want to help our teachers get out of that like that mindset of like, I'm just a teacher. I'm only worth this much. You're not, you are invaluable. And I want to pay you to do that job that you're doing so amazingly well. Yeah. And yet you can still take a walk with a two-year-old in a forest that wants yeah. to hold your hand. <laughs> yes, I can. Whenever I want, yeah. I'm like, I, I mean, there's days when I pinch myself. I'm like, I get paid to, I get paid to go on a forest walk today with a two-year-old. Like yeah. that's pretty amazing. <laughs> what do you get paid yeah. to do? Yeah. Well, yeah. I'd rather go on the, I'd rather go on the walk than what I've been doing. So <laughs> <laughs> like I said, that, this is great. Uh, Jen, how would people that want to inquire uh, about owning a, a franchise, how would they get a hold of you? Yeah. So the best way is really to contact us through our website. It's a place to grow.com. A P L A C E T O G R O W dot com. Um, we are on Facebook, we're on Instagram, Pinterest, LinkedIn. You can find us under a place to grow for all of them. Um, and our logo is this beautiful tree with woodland animals and two children swinging from it. So you'll know us when you find it. Um, and a funny story about our logo all of those animals actually have a meaning and represent a different family member in my life. Hmm. Um, and then the middle of the tree is a little heart with an owl in it, and that's my grandmother. Well, that's cool. Yeah. And so this has been another great episode of Emerging Brands. If you're thinking of owning a franchise, you know, consider the childcare space because Jen mentioned it's a desert out there in many places. So there's a lot of, you know, it's got, there's a need there, but that means there's also a great business opportunity that you can take advantage of. And if you're also passionate about, you know, giving back, like educating that next generation, you know, they're really small they're but they can make really great clients. And I think you really want to consider this as a good opportunity to get in the education space. My name's Cash Miller. I'm the host of Emerging Brands. I'm also the CEO of Type Media Works. We do podcast production. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you on the next episode.